Hi, good evening. Um, it's only in Germany where my name changes. Everywhere else, I'm Nishant. It's Doctor Professor Nishant here. Um, always a little scary to hear so many titles. So thank you so much for being here. There's so many of you. I was told I'm expecting about 15, 20 people. Um, great, great pleasure. Thank you for the generous introduction, Nico. You know when you see kind of movies and you are about to die and your life flashes in front of you. These introductions feel like that, like, oh my God, this is what's happening to me right now. Um, it's always such a great pleasure to work with Nico. I've known him for five years now, uh, which is interesting. And as he mentioned, I am a little bit jet lagged because I just flew in from Mexico City. Um, but I'm going to keep to time. The, I know the program says two hours, but I'm not going to do that to you. <laughs> Uh, 40, 45 minutes of talking and then let's have some conversations. Um, but it's actually quite interesting that we can act, begin um, talking about the notion of unpopulated cities by locating it back in Mexico. Um, because one of the most interesting things that happened in far away Mexico in 2015, um, so in 2015 in far away Mexico, um, in the middle of arid dry lands, surrounded by coyotes and cacti, there was a plan to build the dream city of the future. It was a one billion US dollar investment and was aimed at creating a 400 acre ghost city to house the latest technological gadgets and innovations that could test out new forms of transactions, deliveries, transportation and movement. There were roads for self-driving cars, empty skies for drones, which could then um, do automated deliveries, minutely mapped out spaces for deep surveillance, delivery routes for industrial, agriculture, and aquatic movement, ravines and terrains for robotic machines to march to the beat of their own mechanical rhythms, testing grounds for last mile delivery stations and distribution and sorting units, experimental stations for self-renewing energy, smart hub for automatic and underground data collection networks that give immediate visualizations of the transactions happening there. It has everything except for toilets in it. Um, it is a city of your dream, right? It is the most cutting edge in infrastructure that you can imagine. It's like a real life sim city exploration where you can build a futuristic city without constraints. A city that's not made ugly by unexpected or irrational by the presence of something as stupid as human beings, because we know that human beings are unthinking creatures who make cities into unlivable spaces, right? Or, or maybe, maybe, maybe it's not a city of your dreams, but maybe it's a city of your nightmares. Um, reminding you of the industrial wasteland from the animated movie Wall-E, where the humans have all fled, and all that is left is this tiny machine that is building a world based on protocols of computer logics. Because this city site in Mexico does not need people. It can house 35,000 people, but they are merely temporary entities who walk in and out in the service of the machines that are testing, experimenting, innovating, and developing new material prototypes uh, of what uh, the future of the city can look like. So, whether you think that this is your Blade Runner dystopia or your Steve Jobs inspired utopia, there is no doubt that this model fundamentally challenges the ways in which we have thought of our cityscapes. And perhaps the primary reason for our discomfort for this model is because we have thought of cities as homes, right? We might critique and question and run away from them, but cities are imagined through populations. The density of people, the number of human beings per square meter, the thronging crowds, the milling populace. The city has an urban imaginary where it's defined and shaped by the people that make it. We understand the city through what uh, the filmmaker Andreas Talskart calls the human scale. A city might be infrastructure, but we think of the infrastructure as housing the people who live in it, making space for work, play, life, labor, and love. Cities are defined by human intentions. They are remembered through collective and individual uh, mem memories. And they are living archives of things that we have done and forgot to do as we lived through them. They are skeletons that we give life to, scaffoldings that we build layers onto, infrastructures that we inhabit, houses that we turn into homes. 
that no matter what the imagination of the city has been in the last few centuries, there is no doubt that the human subject has been at the core of imagining, designing and planning the city. That we belong to cities. In fact, no matter where we live, we call ourselves citizens, right? Literally belonging to the cities. And we also shape the city in unexpected, ineffable, joyful and creative forms through our intersectional experiments. The site thought experiment um, subverts this logic entirely. Uh, it presents to us a future where the city exists without its populations. Um, not a ghost town though, not this forlorn, denuded landscape where there are no people, not even a barren land without life. On the contrary, it's a city that's teeming with life, filled with motion, buzzing with data, ticking like a well-oiled machine, presenting a dashboard of events and activities, transactions and transfers, intersections and communication between smart devices, performing the tasks with efficiency and discipline. The human subject is an intruder in this space, a trespasser with a visitor pass, needed to train the data sets and the self-learning algorithms that generate uh, data for automated systems, but the presence is tolerated only for that purpose. Beyond that, there is no need for the human and there is no infrastructure or facility that can house the human for long-term occupation. In that well-controlled system, any unwarranted, unexpected, unintended or unwelcome presence will be swiftly and ruthlessly dealt with. In the past, when thinking of cities as places that we live in, we have always thought that it is the space that is the problem, right? Space has to be kind of reconfigured and solved in order to accommodate for the human needs that we have. How do we design it? How do we structure it? How do we arrange and inform it so that the needs of the human can be accommodated have been questions that planners have asked for a long time. With the site experiment, uh, what we have now um, is um, looking at a complete inversion of this logic. The human is the problem to be solved. The irrational element that needs to be controlled, the resource that needs to be designed and governed. So even while sites remains uh, a, a fantasy thought experiment in the deserts of Mexico, and there are others which are coming up in Russia, uh, in the Ukraine, uh, in, in Singapore and so on, um, they are signaling to some kind of an unpopulated space, which is the future of the cities as they are being proposed. Architecturally speaking, and I speak as somebody who's trained as a physical computation architecture um, engineer, one of the reasons why this particular future of site is something that we cannot ignore as a thought experiment is because of our increasing reliance on computation. I don't know if anybody told you this, but you don't really live with machines anymore. You actually live in a giant machine. Even without thinking about it or knowing about it, our cities have already been converted into a giant supercomputer. You are continuously surrounded by transactional technologies which are guiding you, mobilizing you, and shaping you in your everyday life practices in ways that we don't even see uh, in everyday practice. Because take the example of self-driving cars, right? Um, if autonomous cars are going to hit our roads in 2022, as it's been planned, one of the problems is going to be that our cities will literally have to turn into massive data centers because when an automated car hits the autobahn in Germany and it's driving at 300 kilometers per, per hour, if the data is residing in a data farm in Iceland and then being streamed through the car through the cloud, it creates a 0 0.008 millisecond lag, which is catastrophic enough for an accident to happen. That in fact, human beings do not get into accidents because they make decisions faster than 0 0.008 milliseconds in order to make specific decisions at that point which means that in order for an automated car to run through the city, the data center cannot be more than 300 kilometers away from it at any given point of time. That your entire housing unit that you have thought of as planned for human beings will literally have to be rethought as massive data centers within which we will be living. That our roads will be, have to become different kinds of haptic feedback systems which are continuously streaming electricity because remember, electric surging is no longer a possibility. 
that for an automated car to run on a specific highway, and it will most probably not be on a fossil fuel line, but more like the tram lines, which are getting specific kinds of electricities, they will literally need electricity on the roads at any given point of time. Which also means that you and I will no longer be allowed to walk on those roads because we might electrocute yourself if you are walking through them, right? So in order for that future city to be defined, you are going to need now artificial intelligence governance, which lets you know which part of the city are accessible to you and which part are not. That the very physical infrastructure of what constitutes a city is going to change dramatically. And even as you walk through sites, so I was recently in Mexico and visiting them and like all good authoritarian spaces, they do not allow to take a single picture in a 20 kilometer radius. So not even when you are approaching it because the geographical landmarks are kind of blanked out for you. Um, but when you enter site, it actually is aesthetically very pleasing. There, is, there are homes and offices and parks and rivers and everything is actually just a big computer, right? On the surface, it might look the same, but it's going to be dramatically different. So if we take this seriously, that the future of the city is a giant supercomputer, then what we are essentially looking at is a reconfiguration of the human technology relationships and collaboration. Debates about the relationship between the human and the technological, the organic and the machinic are not new though. There have been many responses to the human technology or human infrastructure questions that we're familiar with. The most standard response we get is this, right? Of the diminished human agency and the dystopic vision where the machines will take over. And this is not just a part of like some post-apocalyptic Star Wars meme, um, but it's almost a foreclosed future that we have resigned ourselves to. We are so accepting of this vision that one of the biggest solutions of the future thinks of the human as frail, fragile, and fragmented, irrelevant, and disposable. This is embodied in the vision of what we often call the technological singularity. It is the hypothetical moment when we will have developed an artificial superintelligence that is so strong and powerful that not only will it surpass human intelligence and take control of the world and govern how we live in it, but that it will also become the new face of being human. And I want us to realize that even if this is the first time you are understanding or hearing of a technological singularity, if you are, congratulations, you have avoided Elon Musk all your life, which is a great feat. But if this is the first time you understood it, you realize that singularity doesn't happen just sometime in the future, but that you are already going through it. I know that there are people in the audience who will look at this and laugh and understand, but I want to remind you that it's only been 18 years ago that we knew the relationship between a pencil and an audio cassette. It was only 10 years ago when we thought that friends were people who we lived with and knew in person. It was only eight years ago when we thought that a video is an objective proof which can be presented in a court of law. And it was only four years ago when we started a global worrying about the fact that our jobs are going to be redundant and that at least 30% of the global workforce is going to be replaced by automation. Um, we have already experienced accelerated advances in social, political, economic, cultural, and personal domains, where things as we know them in our lifetime have in fact changed, and technological singularity is this slow process that we are experiencing right now. However, as I said, technological singularity is not even new in computer sciences or computer um, uh, engineering. Because way back in the 1960s, John von Neumann, a German who used to live in the US, who is also called the father of computation architecture, had already a predicted a moment in future when technological advancements would make it impossible for human affairs as we know them to continue beyond a certain point. At the same time when Neumann was making this prediction, for people who uh, know your history of computing, it was being told in 1962 that we will need five computers in the world to take care of all the computational needs that are going to emerge in the future, right? And that five computers will be enough for all of it. However, there were two people who challenged this idea of five supercomputers running the world. One was John McCarthy. McCarthy was a physical computer scientist who used to sit in the uh, SAIL labs in Stanford, who was of the opinion that we will need more computers, not because uh, computers will be things that will be used by human beings, but because computers will actually replace human beings 
for most of the things that we don't want to do in our lives. That the computers will in fact replace human activity and McCarthy is generally considered to be the father of computing in, uh, artificial intelligence and robotics and automation in the history of computing. So McCarthy of course met with many criticism when he presented this view of the computer replacing the human being. And to all of his critiques, he used to offer a simple thought experiment, which I'm going to offer to you right now. I want you to take three seconds and close your eyes and think of the person that you love the most right now. Right? All right, now you can open your eyes. Keep that person in mind. Now imagine a future where this person is severely ill and their life depends in your hands, like literally in your hands. To keep them alive, all you have to do is press a button once every 10 minutes. As long as you keep on doing this, this person's going to live. How many of you will take the responsibility of keeping this person alive now for the rest of your life? Yeah? How long do you think you will last? Two hours, six, 24, three days, five days, every 10 minutes, pressing a button without a fail, on the mark, exactly at that point? How long do you think you are going to last? Forget how long you're going to make that person live. In this particular case, McCarthy had a very clear idea. Human beings are fragile. Human beings hate tediousness and repetition. Human beings get bored. Human beings get incredibly distracted from the kind of things that require us to pay focused attention for a long time. A machine is just so much better at keeping you alive. Because right now, if I had to give you a choice between a robotic finger that comes and presses that button every 10 minutes and you having to do it manually, I'm almost certain you will recognize that the robotic button should be doing that work because you will just make it rely on it better, right? Human beings are not as reliable as, as these robots. So um, McCarthy had this particular idea of the computation uh, creating a network of conversations and connections where they learn from each other and do all the things that human beings are really rubbish at. And we are very rubbish at a lot of things, including governing our planet and its species. Which is why people like Elon Musk, now he comes into your life, um, take up John McCarthy's idea and develop laboratories which uh, have taken his call very seriously and are now interested in developing an artificial superintelligence, which is not merely a prosthetic supercomputer where the human being would be able will be replaced by this robotic arm that's pushing buttons, but a supercomputer which will be fast enough so that human beings can offload their data onto the computer and live forever, right? This is the ultimate vision of technological singularity. Because remember, we are already partially data. We think of ourselves in terms of genetic code and DNAs and thoughts which can be stored and memories which can be archived and so on and so forth. All we need is enough measurement in order to finally just offload all the things that we have onto a computer and live through it uh, through technological consciousness, right? So this is the one absurd um, end of technological singularity that we are often faced with. The second big response to human technological um, cohabitation um, came from um, Douglas Engelbart. Because while McCarthy was interested in replacing human action, in the same lab, like literally on the same floor, but on the other side of Stanford, uh, used to sit Douglas Engelbert, who is possibly the only non-technological person who's featured in the history of modern computation, because Engelbert was a visionary. He was of the opinion that in order for computers to become popular, human beings and computers will have to learn how to talk to each other and meet each other halfway. Engelbart, in fact, actually proposed experiments to be taught to school children in school, where children would be lined up in a row and they would be taught how to compute using binary code, right? And because all computations actually just electricity, which is passing through zeros and ones, they would actually put children and saying, I'm going to pass you a current. One of you is a flag up, that's a one. If you are a flag down, you are a zero. And now I'm going to poke you, which is an electric current, and you will learn how to behave like a computer. Engelbart had a very simple proposition. He said that in order for human beings to um, live in the future, what we are essentially going to need is to evolve human beings in order to meet up with the technologies that we are inventing right now. That 
the technological prostheses and the human self together form an augmented unit which otherwise we are more familiar uh, it's as calling cyborgs right engelbart's vision of changing the hu human to evolve it for the rising technologies finds its feet in the fields of biogenetics and molecular nanotechnology right now so i don't know how many people have heard of alphabet the company this is the parent company that shows google now uh, since 2016 alphabet uh, made a startling promise they have decided that the cure to human life is to do away with death not to do away with disease or disability or any such thing but the problem with human life is that we keep on aging right that we keep on growing old our bodies reach a particular peak of biological robustness and from there on it's a downward spiral they decided that they're going to now invest entirely in molecular technology to produce a biogenetic subsidiary which is going to look at human mutations genetically modifying the code and dna of being human filling up our bodies with technologies chips nanoparticles and synthetically fabricated microbial life forms which will at some point stop cell decay and and cell aging thus granting us immortal life the promise of immortality very distinctly is of long life but not as a human this will be a life form that is now so regulated and dependent on the technologies that are keeping it alive that it will have to be thought of as a new race So if these experiments find fruition we will be in a new age of designer babies where fetal dna can be modified to give it particular characteristics machine measurements will be able to typify individuals before they find a voice and decisions of who gets to choose and who should not be afforded life will be taken by algorithms that will determine the efficiency and the probability of a genetic sequence the feminist philosopher and epistemology of science donna haraway had warned us in the 1980s that as we shift to these kinds of technological life forms we are actually moving from eugenics to genetics and while i take make this talk in nuremberg i don't need to remind us from recent history how dangerous eugenics has been in study of race in study of violence and the ways in which we have destroyed entire civilizations in the name of war and hatred so the experiments that um McCarthy started you know led to the production uh, of intel artificial intelligence and robotics as we understand now the vision that engelbert produced led to the development of personal machines graphical interfaces and human computer interaction models um where we don't just work with our machines but we live with them i don't know how many people have hugged their computer at least once in a lifetime or because it was just so sweet that day or how many people have slapped your phone because the battery is not charging and so on and so forth right that we speak in languages gestures and signs that develop a new secret language between the technology and us so in both of these visions um either of the diminished human which has to be offloaded to the artificial super intelligence technologies or of the human who will be augmented by the insertion of technologies on in our body there are the seeds for the unpopulated future that the site experiment offer because in both of these the technological and the human are posited as contradictory contrary and in opposition to each other the contemporary moment is the one where we increasingly see the rise of digital technologies but digital futures of human beings this inversion where the human being is a problem to be solved where the human has to measure up to the scripts of predictive technologies is new and this is a shift that looks like it mimics what engelbart and mccarthy were talking about but it's not it's a shift which i want to kind of go into where it's a shift from possibility to probability from mathematics to logic and from intensity to scale and i know that this is very dense so i'm now going to wear my professorial hat and do a small academic lecture uh trying to just tease out some of the things which are uh, necessary to understand in this particular shift so um i don't know what the audience constitution is like so i'm just going to ask very honestly is there anybody who has studied either higher mathematics or first order of logic in your education excellent so maybe you can help me tease this out a little bit 
If I were to tell you that there is a difference between a fundamental difference difference between mathematics and logic, would anybody be able to help me explain what that difference would be? Like maths and logic as two specific forms of thinking through the world that we live in. Okay, I don't want to put anybody on the spot, but if I'm wrong or if you can add to it later, maybe you can help me try it later on, right? So the most interesting thing about logic is that logic is a closed loop system of thinking, which means that every element within a defined logical system has only two sets of relationships that are available. One is causal, X leads to Y. So X happens and hence it leads to Y happening. Or the relationship can be uh, correlative that X and Y happen together. It doesn't need to be a causal relationship, but that X tends to Y, which means that if X happens, then Y is also happening, but there is no causal relationship between the two. Right? This is like basic fundamental first order of logic. The reason why these relationships exist in logic is because it allows for a particular kind of meaning making that we have now taken for granted. Let's take this very simple experiment. If I throw this mic up in the air, I won't. Um, but if I throw this mic up in the air, what's going to happen next? It's going to fall down, brilliant, right? It doesn't require like huge amount of knowledge to do that. Now the reason we know that this microphone is going to fall down is not because we understand logic, not because somebody taught us gravity, not because you understand the theory of relativity, but because you have seen this happening in your life over and over again, that when things go up, they fall down. What you have done essentially is pattern recognition. You have recognized a pattern and you realized that the more things happen, the more the chances are that they will happen again, right? So the basic premise of logic is that if something happens once, it can happen again. And if more things happen, the more the chances are that it will happen again. To such an extent that if you ask a logical person, like everybody else in this room, what will happen if you throw a mic in the air, they will say it falls down. Now, if you go to a mathematician, she will be absolutely paralyzed by this question. Because mathematics is very close to art. It is only in a room of mathematics theory where you are allowed to go into a classroom, put out your hand and say, imagine that this is a point. Right? Look back at any other discipline that you might have studied. Imagine you could go into a classroom exam and say, imagine that this is democracy. <laughs> the teacher is going to give you a zero. But in maths, you can walk into a classroom and say, imagine that this is a point. And from here, you have to take a leap of faith and work out a working theory of everything that needs to accommodate for this imagined point that you have created. So a mathematician, if she is really into higher maths and especially in quantum mathematics, would immediately say that if you throw this mic up, from here on, it's going to have millions of permutations and combinations. For example, Nico could jump from his seat and grab the mic and run away with it. The chances are very low, but it might happen. The mic might decide at this particular point to disintegrate into its atoms and fall upon us as a shower. Chances are very low, but can happen. In fact, a wormhole might open up and the mic travels across the wormhole into a new dimension and gets somewhere else as well. These are all funny because they are in the realm of the possible and not of the probable. Mathematics, like art, deals with possibility, whereas logic, like social sciences, deals with probability. And the computer was not always designed to be a logical or a probability machine which depends on pattern recognition. In fact, at the heart of computing is mathematical possibility. What we have made it into is a condition of probability. And it is in this shift between possible and the probable that increasingly our computational features, futures are being defined. Because if you fall on the scale of logic and probability, then all you can think of is numbers, measurement, matrices, and correlative relationships. So you do away with everything that is unexpected, creative, joyful, or fun, because those are not logical ways of measuring how the human person exists. So what we are talking about necessarily is that computers come with this idea of pattern recognition. And that more and more as we build digital cities or digital futures, what we are essentially saying is that there are only a few probabilities 
with a very high chance of them succeeding and those are going to be the only options which are available to us and this is why i'm saying that experiments like sight are drawing from a history of computation in order to present to us a specific kind of a vision which is probability driven as opposed to possibility driven if this were true then we should all just stop the talk now and go home and hide our heads in our pillows and cry a little bit because this is the beginning of digital totalitarianism and an authoritarian state if we want to resist it maybe we need to have a different kind of a script and maybe it needs to begin with art so what i want to show you is five examples of artistic practice that challenge the things that we have taken for granted or naturalized in the digital future building that we are doing and see if we can find at least some hope of resistance of disruption and building a new kind of a universe which is not merely science fiction or fantasy but a reality that we want to live in so one of the first um, biggest problems of these computational futures is that computation deals with binaries right so yes no right right wrong black white good bad um these are all coded and tabled in the databases that run computing the binary nature is not because of merely the binary language of electricity but actually because of statistical modeling statistics again going back to logic and uh, that is at the heart of probability mapping so wendy chern who's probably one of the smartest new media theorists alive right now has a fantastic book called updating to remain the same uh, which came out a couple of years ago she points out that computation networks sort us on the principles of homophily and thus construct different kinds of neighborhoods i know that's a lot of words thrown at you so let me try and explain this a little bit more uh, i'm not going to do as good a job as wendy does you should read her book for it but this is exciting enough does everybody have a social media account of some kind facebook twitter snapchat instagram whatsapp something more or less all right uh, has anybody ever taken a quiz about what harry potter character you are no which character from harry potter or sex in the city or whatever other series that you are watching now this is interesting when we take a quiz the answers if we have the same kind of an answer right so if both of us think that i am harry potter and you are harry potter and we share that particular result the computing algorithms then establish a principle called a principle of homophily which basically says that the like attracts like if two things are alike each other in one thing then the chances are that they are alike each other in many many other things so there is a series of data sets which are continuously being produced which mines our likeness how are we together and once we are together the database and the computation network puts us into what is called a data neighborhood we are not the same but we are in the same neighborhood of things right so gender sexuality race ethnicity income where you live what kind of devices you use are just some of the data points and it just gets more and more complex from that so that most social media giants in trying to build our profile creates roughly between 27000 to 38000 data points which try and put us into specific kinds of networks which are then going to use to customize who we are in that specific uh, model yeah so homophily uh leads to only has only one reason homophily leads to polarization in measuring how we are alike what they are essentially measuring is how we are not alike what are the differences which are actually present that's how statistical modelings work right you you work out a mean and an average and that's the common denominator and then we need to figure out how to make you shift from the mean above or below that which means that every time you take a harry potter quiz once i have figured out what your profile is in two clicks from there i can either take you to an alt right conservative right wing website or i can take you to an extremely like hard bleeding liberal left wing website but it takes only two clicks from there because i have identified what the difference is right that digital media especially computational media deal with polarization that is the default they need us to be as distinct as possible so that they can be we can be dealt with in intelligent ways and one of the things that happens with digital cities is that it wants to build these kinds of polarized settings 
This is very different from the older forms of city planning where we used to do lovely things like this is where people will work and this is where they will live and this is where they will go for play and so on. No, this is where you are going to get ghettos where you are no longer able to determine why we are alike except that an algorithm said that. Yeah. Now here is an art project in India which actually tries to counter this, especially in the face of the Me Too movements and the kind of gender and sexuality abuse that is happening um, all around us. This is a project called the Blank Noise Project uh, by an artist called Jasmine Patheja, who is a digital public activist and an artist and essentially talks to us about how we need to be able to think about not polarization, but conversation as the new default of the digital. Especially in the days of filter bubbles and eco chambers and network neighborhoods, how do you make two unlike things to talk to each other? And they take up a very real problem. This is not a thought experiment anymore. Jasmine started this project called the Blank Noise Project 15 years ago, which has more than 10,000 volunteers who meet online, so they've never met each other. And they came up with a specific problem about public harassment of women on the streets in India. And every time this question of public harassment or Me Too or cyberbullying or gender and sexuality discrimination comes up, it leads to increasingly polarized conversations. Just look back at your immediate social circle and you will realize that more or less these people have exactly the same ideas about gender and its discrimination in society that you are all like believing that the world is really dire and we need to do something about women's rights, or you are on the other end of the spectrum and saying, oh, well, it's just another thing which will pass, right? But we rarely get to talk to people who are unlike us. So Jasmine and her volunteers do this thing where they invite people to come to the streets with one table, two chairs and a cup of coffee. And they sit on the streets and every time they see an act of public harassment happening, they invite the other person to come and sit with them and have a conversation. So not the person who has been harassed, but the person who is doing the harassing. You offer them a chair, you make them sit down, and you talk about why is it that they did what they did? Why is it that they are engaging in these kinds of activities despite knowing that this might not be the best thing to do? The Talk To Me project has been now going on for seven years. It has been done in 58 cities in the whole world including the global north and the global south. And every single time it has led to a new form of thinking about how do you engage in city spaces where we begin with difference and we engage with it in a certain way. And this is a completely different way of thinking about the, uh, the notion of polarization and how do we go about it. The next artist I want to introduce to you um, talks about some, uh, it comes from a Bulgarian studio called Fine Acts. And she tackles this idea of what the future is going to look like. So over the last 10 years, one of the projects that I have been researching and working with is called Digital Alternatives with a Cause, which looks at a lot of young people in the global south and how they engage with digital technologies to bring about social transformation. I remember in 2015, when I was sitting in Johannesburg, and then there was this 16-year-old young black woman who came to me and she's, a, she's one of our interviewers and I was talking with her and she said one of the things that always scares her is when all these European researchers come to her and one of the things that they ask these black African kids to do is write an essay about when I grow up I want to be and then there is a dot 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 right and the child has to fill that up it's supposed to be some kind of a design thinking hack to make them imagine the future. Nongku, who was 16 at that point, who grew up in a township just outside Durban, was now studying in Johannesburg, said every time somebody asked her that question, she used to get paralyzed with fear because she doesn't know how to end it. She says the capacity of imagining a future is a privilege which I do not have. The future is a scarce commodity. And in 16 years, I have learned this over and over again. I grew up in a township where for a black 16 year old with only one parent alive, I know what my future is supposed to look like and I'm not ready to complete that sentence yet. Yeah, We need to be able to imagine the privileges that we have in terms of future commodities and the ways in which computing technologies specifically talk about our futures. 
because our future as with the polarization is also very unevenly distributed and especially with things like global climate change but also the ways in which human rights activism and uh, backlash against it has been evol evolving uh, around the world i don't need to remind you of chemnitz which is not very far from here and how little it takes and how to break our fragile democracies back to the grassroots of tribalism we need to be able to perhaps think of the future in a more collective way except that digital technologies do not allow for that because they have put you into a specific kind of a network neighborhood it takes 300% more effort from you to go and seek information which you do not like our our news informations as our cityscapes are entirely almost mapped out as things that we are comfortable with so i don't know if you ever traveled in the global south and use google maps for example for navigation and if you are a white european with a german phone who is walking down for example in rio uh sometimes if you ask for walking directions google maps will show you that something is 22 kilometers away which doesn't really make sense so for me this is very personal i've been going to rio for a while and when i was going on an indian phone it used to show me that the distance is 3 kilometers but now that i have a european phone it showed me that the distance is 22 kilometers and i'm like uh no i know that this is not true but because the phone has realized that i am from europe it's no longer allowing me to walk through a flavela which has been marked as unsafe and so it's making me walk all around it in order to reach a specific place right this is how the futures are kind of shared in different ways so um the project i have in front of you is by this bulgarian female activist artist called yana bulder tavanier and she is the founder of the fine acts and they have done this project where this particular word future is spelled out in multiple different languages across the world and the lights light up based on the data that is continuously being received on reporting of human rights violence in that particular country this particular sign is germany and domestic sexual abuse for every time there is a set certain number of complaints around domestic sexual abuse which means husbands basically or partners who are abusing their wives largely these things light up or these things light down so the whole chart begins with a completely lighted up if you want to look at the future of gender sex and sexuality rights in the your country this is it it's this underlit and they do a series of installations like that across the world um so here is one again which is germany um that is in south korea uh, that is marriage equality which was doing there so they look at a lot of big data analysis not in order to present happy visualizations that we are so used to funny little icons that move cute little things that come and tell us that things are going not really very well and so on but instead they put up these public installations as ways of visualizing what you can do with the big data if it's not merely being used in order to sell us better products on tripadvisor that there has to be a different kind of shared value of the future which is not about commodified and customized forms of city spaces and cityscapes so you can check out more of um, yana's work later the third shift which i have already mentioned very briefly is the shift between um scale and intensity so one of the things that digital technologies also do to our understanding of the city is that they replace human experience which is about intensity by scale which is a different form of measurement to make this very crystal clear if you go back home today and your partner asks you do you love me your correct reply cannot be i love 5000 people your correct reply should be i love you this much right the this much is intensity i love 5000 people is scale and that digital technologies necessarily favor scale over intensity it is not how much you love but how many that is going to provide the ways in which you think about yourself in certain ways so here is ben grosser uh, who is an american media artist who built something called the facebook demetricator and the demetricator is now available across all platforms for you to download it works on twitter instagram and facebook and it does this thing if you in install the demetricator it removes all the numbers from all social media settings it no longer allows you to measure so you will see that you have a notification that somebody has hearted you that somebody who has left a comment but you will no longer be able to see how many and ben's been doing this work for the last 3 years and coming up with incredible insights on how 
people react differently once the numbers are taken away. That the minute you lose sense of the scale, that you're not looking at X number of followers, thousands of people liking it, going viral, but you're thinking about intensity, maybe it's a different kind of a geography of emotions that you need to be thinking through. And Ben continuously reminds us that there is a possibility of working beyond numbers. That there's a possibility of connecting with each other beyond merely just quantification or the quantified self that we so easily buy into. And that we need to start thinking about the future development of our cities and sociality outside of the quantified numerics and going back to intensity in a certain way. Right? The fourth transition I want to uh, point, and sorry, so I'm just reading from Ben's paper and he makes us realize that despite our despite their love for numbers, companies like Facebook and Google actually are not concerned about numbers at all. They don't care how many followers and friends you have. They don't care how many times a post has been shared. What they care about actually is intensity. They want to know what makes you really angry or really happy because the intensity is the life of a viral post and not the number of times it's being shared. So we need to just think that there is a specific kind of an interest in intensity which is taken away from us and being owned by the seven, metropoli seven megalopolises which are running the internet and maybe we need to retrieve it in a certain way. The fourth transition I want to kind of point out to you is this idea of the um, measuring of a human body, right? So it's, it is again about computational technologies and how measurements happen. Now, for the longest time, the world around us has been thought of as it needs to measure up to what the human person wants, desires, or likes, right? So um, borrowing from the artist who we are seeing right now, who did this selfie installation uh, as a part of a much larger project, and for reasons that he only knows, refuses to give his name, but only puts his face onto the project, um, reminds us that if you go into a restaurant, and you order food, and if you do not like it, the chef is not allowed to say your taste, taste buds are stupid. <laughs> you should eat what I have cooked for you, right? Because a service is supposed to measure up to your expectations of that service. When you go to digital technologies, and when you say things like, this is not working for me, they look at you and saying, you must be stupid, right? Because if something goes wrong, when in, a human being engages with digital technologies, she is the person that is stupid and needs to be solved. And it goes to the heart of computation. So if anybody's ever sat through like the introduction to computer science's classrooms, I don't remember, I don't know if you were taught two things. One is called GIGO, G-I-G-O, which literally means garbage in, garbage out. If you write code and if the answer is garbage, you made a mistake because computers do not make errors. Right? So you fed it garbage, so it's fading out garbage. And the second one is called Visivig, which might be more familiar to you. It is what you see is what you get. It makes us believe that if I press a button on this, on this laptop right now, and if an A appears here, that there's a direct correlation between that button and that A, not allowing us to realize that there are nine levels of translation that happen, nine checkpoints about whether the information is valid or not, nine different places where the data is stored without my consent before it appears my screen as an A. There is a specific mode that we are falling into where increasingly we are accepting that the human is not the measure of reality or of efficiency, but the human has to measure up to the new kinds of realities and efficiencies that are coming around. And here is work from a German American artist called um, Jennifer Lynn Monroe, who presented at the Transmediala two years ago. And I don't want to talk about her work because the video that she's made around it is actually incredibly you know, interesting. And I'm just going to show it to you. Can we turn down the lights for a bit? Okay, thank you. I, th I think that should be enough. I just, okay, brilliant. We are all data slaves. I don't know about you, but I've had enough of being exploited. You know who's got it made? Corporations. If companies can make money from my information, information that I generate just by being alive, then so can I. I've decided to play their game, but with a little twist, by bringing the whole process down to the individual by incorporating my identity. What's my solution? Extreme capitalism. 
I'm now the founder, CEO, shareholder, and product of Jennifer Lynn Marone, Inc. As a corporation, who I am, how I am, and what I do is for me to exploit, making my life, my existence, and the data I generate my business. This is not about everybody getting rich. It's about everybody getting their fair share. Let me explain how this works. I've broken down every aspect of how I am as a human into physical, mental, and biological services. Take a look over here. On my website, people can go to ask to use me. Debates to request are also transparent, so if you ask me to do something dangerous and unethical, you better be prepared to answer why. Shareholders vote on major decisions. Perhaps I'll be used for what I do best. Perhaps it will go terribly wrong. At the same time, I'm capturing and collecting as much data about myself as I possibly can, so I can analyze, package, and sell it as I see fit. I'm using all the same methods of surveillance and data collection that companies and governments do to us now. The only difference is that I'm not interested in your information. I'm only interested in collecting mine. And I'm going to be fully transparent about it all, meaning I'm making it live and public. Why? Because we're that transparent to those watching us now. As I gain control to this, with this exposure, I will become more opaque. I also want to test what's the worst that can happen. If someone steals my identity, I don't stop existing. If everything is happening out in the open, caught on camera, with sensors, every action streamed live, is there still danger? Well, you'll have to watch to find out. This is extreme capitalism. All right, I, I, I'm sorry the audio is not really very clear, but Monroe is making a very simple point, right? Um, that what she is doing is, she's making it very clear to you that right now, if we had to make a decision between your safety and the safety of your data, you will be sure to know that the data is more secure than any of your biological forms right now. That if you were to enter into a conflict with any of the major companies like Facebook or Google or Amazon about data security, the chances are that you will always lose your battle because in 2003, we already granted corporations a human status. Corporations are now in, this, in the contemporary time able to claim human rights like freedom of speech, freedom of expression, freedom of dignity and freedom of sec security and safety and that we are investing more and more in keeping our data safe as opposed to keeping human beings and people safe. If you look at the technological security protocols and budgets of the European Union, you realize that you need only 4% of their entire budget to give housing to every single person who's been seeking refugee in this continent. But we do invest more in data security than we do right now in looking after the people who are coming to our shores. And so Monroe decides to incorporate herself and say she says she feels more protected and safe as a corporation than she does as an individual. And then the last um, point I want to make for you before I know I'm terribly running out of time um, is to just think about the questions of obedience and resistance. Because in the, in the landscape that I have drawn for you, it becomes very obvious that there are very few options of opting out of the universality of algorithms. Because as you can see from this visual, face algorithms already tell us who we talk to, what we buy, where we go, how we go there, how much we earn, and who we marry and date. These things are given. Like you don't even realize that these are the ways in which things are being manipulated, but this is where it is. And it seems to be very difficult to break apart outside of this machinic language. But here is this Taiwanese um, uh, artist called Kuang Po Chi, who did this incredible project called Bee Poetry. It's a really very simple project. The art collective that uh, Bobo, that's, his, that's the name that we all call him by, the art collective that Bobo uh, represents, um, printed something called soft barcodes. Right? So they were barcodes which were, which were on, um, on very, very, very soft um, fabric. And then they conducted a flash mob where they invited 10,000 volunteers across the city of Taipei to go into the six biggest stores in the, in the city overnight and insert and replace the bar existing barcodes with the new barcodes that they had printed. Right? So 10,000 people invaded the stores of Taipei 
and they put in all these new barcodes and every time the scanner would put a barcode like when you take it to the cashier and the scanner would print it it would basically show it different kinds of messages which were largely poetry right doing away with numbers doing away with the universal languages and they very quickly realized that this wasn't rocket science because the technologies which use barcode recognition have a 102 licensing which anybody can do in effect you can create a barcode the next time you go shopping in ikea just generate your own one put it onto a thing and see what happens in that particular space right that there is resistance technology is not a necessarily naturalized script and artists have been showing us over and over again how to take ownership and control back of our machines and technologies because we cannot leave them only in the hands of people who are going to decide what our futures are going to look like so this is where i'm going to end that the future of cities is not just the future of physical spaces it's a future that shapes controls informs and is informed by the kind of human that we want to live in the face of technological advancement the current predictive technology uh, which is probability driven computational scripts that are being offered to us by alg algorithmic processes and the ways in which the human is being reduced to becoming a user can only offer us a vision of unpopulated cities cities where we might live but we might not do anything else cities where either the human is tolerated or the human is trained to become more like machines we need to be able to go back to art and culture not just to reclaim the space for the human but to champion for things that make the human future more desirable we need to find processes not of beautification and gentrification of aesthetic and pleasure those are indeed some of the things that art and culture have to offer but most importantly art offers us a new vocabulary that's an alternative to the scripts that are being written by us written for us by these digital futures that we need to create a new lexicon of what it means to be human if we are not going to merely live with technologies but live within technologies of different kinds and that we need to offer and think about these different kinds of touchstones of conversation of shared values of intensity of the human as the measure and of resistance in order to create playful and human futures that the digital cities that we seek to build and i'll stop here thank you very much